This is the My Campaign Coach Podcast, where we talk about how to win elections. Every week, we let you hear straight from the best consultants, operatives, and candidates in the game, all for one reason, to help you win. For more information about how we can help you win, visit MyCampaignCoach.com. Now, here's your host, Raj Schaefer. Welcome, y'all. It's good to be back, and today we're, uh, we're not doing an interview, we're going to talk about leadership. And I've mentioned the book Extreme Ownership and Jocko Willink and Leif Babin before here on the podcast, and uh, we're going to actually be taking a chapter from their book today and be talking about it a little bit. And the reason is that in the last, man, over the last couple of months, I've got to uh, talk to a lot of people and, and get downloads from some meetings where some awful leadership traits were on display. And one of the things that I learned quickly through my coaching experience here in politics was that you, know, you don't run for office unless you consider yourself a leader. I think you know probably the vast majority of folks that listen to this podcast would consider themselves to be leaders and probably good ones. And I'd imagine that most of you are. But the thing about leadership is that it's like being strong or uh, mentally tough or anything else, and it's it's a perishable skill that if you're not constantly working to improve it, there's going to be some kind of decline line. You can chart it on a graph that uh, if you're not working to constantly improve, then you're going to be falling off. And in campaigns, the interesting thing about them is that you're running for a leadership position public office of some sort, you're going to have, be a leader by definition, uh, but you can be a leader in public office and be an awful one. And so while through my coaching originally, I was looking to primarily look at the fundamentals of campaigns and how we actually win elections. And that's a huge part of what we do. But I realized as I started working with people that there was a lot of uh, reinforcement or remedial education when it comes to leadership that's necessary. And I'll be the first to admit that I want to constantly be becoming a better leader because I'm not nearly where I want to be. So what I did was one of the best books that I've read on leadership was called Extreme Ownership by Jocko and Leif. And it, it really satisf- checks all the boxes for me. So it has military history and Navy SEALs and has, uh, has cool business stories. And I love the book. And I highly recommend it. If you want to become a better leader, it's great. I've done a, a listen to Jocko's podcast, which is one of my favorites uh, since it first began. I just can't recommend what these guys do highly enough. I've actually also been to one of their their muster live events, and so I really uh, I really like what they do, and I really like a lot of the principles they talk about. And they have they have uh, I think it's twelve chapters in their book, and they basically break it down as far as they have different lessons and they they have three parts each chapter first is they tell a story so they look back primarily to their time uh, in 06 in in Ramadi Iraq and the task force bruiser days with Chris Kyle and JP Donnell and uh, a bunch of bunch of badasses over there during the Anbar or leading up to the Anbar awakening and they take you know a story they talk about the principle that they're trying to illuminate through the story. And then they take a case study from business because they've been doing a lot of you know business training and coaching uh, leadership work you know, th- through the corporate community for a number of years through their company, Echelon Front. So the lesson we're going to talk about today comes from chapter two of that book. And I don't anticipate we're going to do this on a regular basis, but it's because of how many of these stories that I've been hearing about bad leaders and especially things like defensiveness and unwillingness to take responsibility and to really step up and, and lead their team. Um, I wanted to go into this, and the, the title of the chapter is No Bad Teams, Only Bad Leaders. And Leif Babin is one of the guys that wrote it. They kind of trade off writing chapters throughout the book. And I'm going to read some portions from the story portion. Uh, there's the story part that they talk about. And in this case, Leif is going back to a time when he was observing some of a Bud's class training evolution out in Coronado a number of years ago. This is leading up to when, this is when Leif, was, after the Ramadi deployment in Task Force Bruiser, when he was actually on the West Coast training all officers. So you have, if you're an officer that came through BUDS, then you go separate for junior officer training. So Leif was running that. And so in this case, Leif is out there. He's on the beach. They've got, they're doing what they call boat races. So they split the buds, buds class up into had their resident inflatables, and they would give them uh, complicated 
very short mission instructions, and they'd race them. And these are very tough races, you can imagine. If you've seen anything or know anything about buds, uh, this is not an easy time. So we're going to read a little bit here. So when this class had started basically an underwater demolition SEAL training, it was BUDS, the SEAL basic training course several weeks before, nearly 200 determined young men had eagerly begun. All dreamed of becoming U.S. Navy SEALs, prepared for years, and came to BUDS with every intention of graduating. And yet within the first 48 hours of Hell Week, most of those young men had surrendered to the brutal challenge, rung the bell three times, the signal for DOR, or drop on request, and walked away from the dream of becoming a SEAL. They had quit. So at this point, we're a couple weeks into to the BUDS training. These are not easy quitters. These are people who have been fighting hard and who have, they're in the, the top few percent of their class as far as they're still in this thing. He goes on to talk about how Hell Week is not a fitness test. Right? It's basically about mental toughness. And some of the best athletes in the class didn't make it through Hell Week. Success resulted from determination and will, but also from innovation and communication with the team. Such training graduated men who were not only physically tough, but could also outthink their adversary. Uh, you know, those are very, things that are very important to SEALs, and they don't just need the meanest, biggest knuckle draggers out there. They want guys who can think, who can be leaders. And so they, they trade off regularly throughout the, throughout the different weeks of the training evolutions who's leading. And so they'll oftentimes pick guys who they think are slacking her, who are hiding, kind of being gray men, and they'll pull them to the front and say, okay, now you're the leader. Take the mission brief, go and execute. Because they want to put these guys in situations where they got to put up or shut up. So now Leif is there. He's wearing the blue and gold shirt of a SEAL instructor following two combat deployments in Iraq. He said, I was assigned to the Naval Special Warfare Training Center to instruct the junior officer training course. So he's down there observing. The BUD students were grouped into teams, boat crews, of seven men established by height. Each seven-man boat crew was assigned to an IBS, inflatable boat small. An IBS was small by U.S. Navy terms, but awfully large and heavy when carried by hand. These large rubber boats, painted black and yellow on the rim, weighed nearly 200 pounds and became heavier still when filled with water and sand. A relic from the Navy Frogmen, or the UDT teams, of World War II. The dreaded boats had to be awkwardly carried everywhere usually upon the heads of seven boat crew members struggling underneath. On land, the boat crews carried them up and over 20 feet high sand berms and ran them for miles along the beach. They carried them on the hard asphalt streets back and forth across the Naval Amphibious Base Coronado, trying like hell to keep up with the instructors leading the way. The boat crews even pushed, pulled, squeezed, and muscled the unwieldy boats through ropes and over telephone poles, walls, and the notorious Buzz obstacle course. Out on the Pacific Ocean, the boat crews paddled their boats through the powerful crashing waves, often capsizing and scattering wet students and paddles across the beach like a storage shipwreck. These damn rubber boats were the source of a great deal of misery for the men assigned to them. Each boat had a Roman numeral painted in bright yellow on the front, indicating the boat crew number. All except the boat crew made of the shortest men in the class, known as a Smurf crew. They had the bright blue surf Smurf painted on the bow of their boat. So in all these cases, you got these guys ranked by height, and as you might imagine, there there could be some feeling of uh, that there was an advantage for the taller ones. But they because they were carrying these things around their heads, they had to have them you know rated by height to some degree. And the senior ranking man was the guy who served as the crew leader. So he was responsible for receiving the orders from the instructors and the briefing, directing, leading the other six members of the boat crew. So the boat crew leader bore responsibility for the performance of his boat crew. And while each member of the boat crew had to perform, the boat crew leader, by his very position as leader, received the most scrutiny from the instructor or staff. So while it may seem like a pretty cool position to be the guy at the front of the boat, you're commanding the thing, you're in charge, you're exercising some degree of leadership, you're also the one that's going to take the most punishment, you're the one that's given the very brief instructions. Uh, they're, the instructors are trying to confuse you in many cases by giving very brief and sometimes instructions, which you can take a couple different ways. So it's not an easy thing to be doing. Back to the book. During the SEAL training and really throughout the SEAL's career, every evolution was a competition, a race, a fight, a contest. And Buds, the point was driven home by the SEAL instructors who constantly reminded the students it pays to be a winner. When a racing boat crew during Hell Week, the winning boat crew's prize for victory was to sit out the next race or in a few brief minutes of respite from the grueling nonstop physical evolutions. They weren't allowed to sleep, but just sit down and rest, and those were precious commodities. 
but it paid to be a winner. The rule had a corollary, though. It really sucked to be a loser. Second place in the instructor for, instructor vernacular was simply the first loser. But bad f- performance, falling behind, far behind the rest of the pack and coming in dead last, carried especially grueling penalties. Unwanted attention from the SEAL instructors who dished out additional punishing exercises on top of the already exhausting Hell Week evolutions. Meanwhile, the victorious crew celebrated by sitting out the next race, and most important, not getting wet and cold for a few brief minutes. So these guys go forward and they call out, Boat Crew Leaders Report. The boat crew leaders left their boats and ran to take position, forming a smart line in front of the SEAL instructors who laid out the specifics of the next race. Paddle your boats out through the surf, dump boat, paddle your boats down to the next beach marker, then paddle them back into the beach, run up and over the berm around the beach marker and carry head carry back to the rope station, then over the berm and finish here. Got it? The boat crew leaders raced back and briefed their boat crews. Then the race began. In the place of her traditional ready, set, go, the SEAL commanded, stand by, bust them. And then they were off. In every race, there were standout performers. Through this particular hell week, though, one boat crew dominated the competition, boat crew two. They won nearly every single race. They pushed themselves hard every time, working in unison and operating as a team. Boat crew two had a strong leader, and each of the individual crew members seemed highly motivated and performed well. They compensated for each other's weaknesses, helping each other, and took pride in winning, which had its rewards. After each victory, boat crew two enjoyed a few precious minutes of rest while the other boat crews toiled through the next race. The boat crew, too, was still cold and exhausted, and I saw smiles on most of their faces. They were performing exceptionally well. Their winning and morale was high. Meanwhile, boat crew six was delivering a standout performance of a different kind. They placed dead last in virtually every race, often lagging far behind the rest of the class. Rather than working together as a team, the men were operating as individuals, furious and frustrated at their teammates. We heard them yelling and cursing at each other from some distance, accusing others of not doing their part. Each boat crew member focused on his own individual pain and discomfort, and the boat crew leader was no exception. He certainly recognized they were underperforming, but likely in his mind and that of the boat crew, no amount of effort could change that, and that a horrific performance was the result. So at this point, Leif's telling us about two very different crews. These are all very elite physical athletes. These are, by just the very definition, they survived the, the bud strain at this point. These guys are physical specimens. They're also really mentally tough. But they're starting to do something that's not about individuals, it's about teams and relatively large teams as far as what they've been doing to this point in BUDS. They're responsible for in these groups of seven people for a boat, they're paying for each other's mistakes, they're enjoying each other's victories, and at this point we have Boat Crew 2 is just kicking butt. they got a great leader, they're working well together, they're motivating each other, and Boat Crew 6 is the opposite in the spectrum. They're losing everything, which means they're taking lots of extra punishment, and they're turning inward to express their frustrations. They're getting mad at each other. The leader's not taking responsibility, and he's not doing anything to pull his team out of the gutter. So they keep taking more and more punishment. And Leif goes on to say, I, I kept my eye on the leader, Boat Crew 6. If he did not show substantial improvement in leadership ability, he would not graduate from the program. SEAL officers were expected to perform like everybody else, but most important, they were also expected to lead. So far, Boat Crew 6's leader was demonstrating performance of a subpar and unacceptable. Our SEAL Senior Chief Petty Officer, the most experienced and highly respected non-commissioned officer of the SEAL Instructor Cadre, took a keen interest in Boat Crew 6 and their lackluster leader, which, for any of you who aren't familiar with the SEAL teams, the last thing that you want to have happen is for (laughs) the senior NCO to take a keen interest in you and your performance. He told him he better square his boat away. The senior chief was a Goliath of a man, with piercing eyes and instilled fear equally into terrorists on the battlefield and students in training. An exceptionally revered leader himself, he had mentored many young junior officers. Now senior chief offered an interesting solution to Boat Crew 6's atrocious performance. He said, let's swap out the Boat Crew leaders from the best and the worst crews and see what happens. All other controls remained the same. Heavy and awkward boats manned by the same exhausted crews, cold water, gritty and chafing sand, wearied men competing in challenging races. Only a single individual, the leader, would change. How could that possibly make a difference, I wondered. They relayed the plan out to the guys, went through, they got them swapped out, and these, as it became clear, the boat crew six leader who had led the failing team so far, he was immediately excited. 
he saw that he, he believed that the only thing keeping him from being the number one boat in every race was his team. He thought his team sucked, and that was a problem. That was a great part of what he was communicating to them, which did not help in performance. So now he had the opportunity. He got to lead a high-performing team. So what happened at that point? Well, the boat crew, too, was not the, – the leader from them was not happy either because he was going from a high-performing team to just the Boone squad. So this is, uh, this is where we're at. We're taking off for the second race. Stand by and bust them. We we'll watch the boat crew sprint over the berm carrying their boats and hurry off into the surf zone into the dark water. They jumped to their boats and paddled furiously, passing through the crashing waves. They dumped the boat, got everyone back on board, and paddled down the beach. The headlights from our instructor's vehicles caught the reflection of the yellow bands painted around the boat's rims. We could no longer see the boat numbers, however, two boats were ahead of the pack, almost neck and neck, with one buying for the lead. A half mile down the beach, as the instructors followed, the boat crews paddled back into shore. As the boats came in the headlights, the numbers were clearly visible. Boat Crew 6 was in the lead and maintained first place all the way across the finish line, just ahead of Boat Crew 2. Boat Crew 6 had won the race. The miraculous turnaround had taken place. Boat Crew 6 had gone from last to first. The Boat Crew members had begun to work together as a team, and they won. Boat Crew 2 still performed well, though they narrowly lost the race. They continued to challenge Boat Crew 6 for the lead in the follow-on races, and each of those Boat Crews outperformed all the rest with Boat Crew 6 winning most of the races over the better part of the next hour. It was a shocking turn of events. Boat Crew 6, the same team in the same circumstances, only under new leadership, went from the worst broke boat crew in the class to the best. Gone was their cursing and frustration, and gone too was the constant scrutiny and the individual attention they'd received from the steel instructors. Leif goes on to talk about how it was simply just one of those moments that crystallized the importance of leadership in his mind and really kind of settled in that idea of there being no bad teams, only bad leaders. So much of the time, and, and we can all look back on our lives and our work experiences, or even looking back to if you haven't been in a leadership role or been part of a big team, you can look back on study groups and stuff like that in college or high school. And we've seen times when we had a high performing group but had a cancerous leader. And what inevitably happens is that you see a decline in morale, you see a decline in performance, and as with these boat crews, you can have high-performing individuals that, as a team, get crushed by this poor leadership. So throughout this, the, the rest of this chapter, which I, I'm not going to go into too much detail on, we'll keep this a relatively short episode. Throughout this chapter, they go on to talk about the importance of leadership and the importance of a leader as the primary means of determining whether a team is going to succeed in the long term. As with when they, when they swat those people out, Boat Crew 2 had been the number one, was still a number one or number two spot. So through this, the team was willing because they were highly motivated and they were a well-oiled machine at that point. They'd been under good leadership and had learned how to work together. Even with a bad leader, they were able to go in there and, and keep performing very well. The real standout comes from the immediate transformation of Boat Crew 6, who went from dead last to first. One of the biggest things that stands out through my recent experiences and what I've heard, what, you know, what I've been, the conversations I've been having and the story is that leaders have to have a willingness to take ownership over the performance of their teams. This is a difficult thing because defensiveness is a very natural response. Uh, the story they talk about from their consulting background is uh, they're going into work with the, the C-suite of this big company, and there's one member of the team, the chief, chief technology officer uh, in a tech company, who is he's very, very reticent to accept the idea of extreme ownership and saying, you know, whatever comes down to it, if it happens on my watch, I'm responsible. And he ends up being dismissed from the company because over the, the following months, as so much as all the other senior leadership is embracing this idea of taking ownership and pulling together as a team to, to get things done and, and work together, this one guy is making excuses. He's you know, being defensive. He refuses to take responsibility. All things that you know he makes what might seem to be valid excuses, but at the end of the day, 
we're talking about a company. We're talking about results having to be generated. And if this guy is unwilling to accept responsibility and say, look, we're going to do something about this, then he does, shouldn't really have a job. Because if we're unwilling to take responsibility over something, then how can we expect to change it? And if we if we have no idea or no or saying that we have no ability to change something, then why are we in the game? So in order to say that we want to change results from past behaviors, which means to increase the you know, whatever positive outcomes we're trying to generate, unless we're willing to say that I can do that and to provide a plan how, then we're not going to be there for long. And taking ownership of the situation, both the good and the bad, is a critical part of that. When you're running for office, this is really your opportunity to prove your leadership ability. Because I've said it time and time again, if you're a crappy leader during a campaign, if you can't lead your team well there and show yourself to be exhibiting strong leadership qualities, then why should I want you to become an elected official? You might want to vote for the right things. You might have the right gut conservative instincts that I'm looking for. But if you're a poor leader then inevitably things are going to go wrong within your team and the execution that they're going to be having over whatever your sphere of influence is, whether it's dog catcher or president, is going to be subpar. So when we start looking at how strong of a leader you think you are, so we got to ask yourself some questions. So is leadership a rote skill that you can learn or is it a moving target you must constantly strive for? Um, The leader of Boat Crew 6 in the beginning, the one that failed, he thought that he was a leader. He thought he had all that it took to be a good leader, and he was exhibiting that. The problem was that he didn't see his own opportunity or the need for improvement. And in my opinion, leadership is a perishable skill that we got to always be constantly striving to improve. It also shows us that humility is a key strength of leadership. Because we got to ask ourselves, is humility essential to true strength in leadership, or is it possible to consistently achieve 100% results through knowledge, ego, and force of will? And I would submit to you that humility is one of the most important parts of leadership. So let's put this into a campaign scenario. So you've got your goals, you've, you've laid out your game, your game plan, you've got a good team together. You, you've bought together some, some rock stars, whether volunteers and staff, paid staff. Got a good consultant on the team. You and your family are heavily invested. You've got friends, you've got a good kitchen cabinet. Everything's put together so that you're in a strong position for this campaign. But here we are a couple months in, and we're not hitting our goals. Fundraising is not going quite as well. You're doing all right. We're hitting about 60%, 75% of the goal. Door knocking is just not going great. And more importantly, you don't feel like we're moving the needle as far as the numbers that are of people that are, we're persuading to support us. So our plan is starting to unravel a little bit, and we look forward and we project out that if we continue at the current performance level, we're simply not going to win this election or there's no indicator that we should expect to. So we sit down with our team and we've got a couple options as far as how I can handle this as the team leader. I can come in here and I can persecute individuals for the areas that they were given responsibility over for not knocking enough doors, not having enough positive conversations, not executing the scripts that I've written well enough on the fundraising team for not getting enough people to events, those kind of things. That's one route. And that's how I've seen some candidates do things. Uh, You might even go in there and talk about how great of a leader you are and all the other high-performing teams that you've led in the past and say, this is, just talk about how great you are. And through that, try to really reinforce, whether it's intentional or not, in your team that they're the problem, not you. Because you're a high-performing leader. How could you be the problem here? So they need to get their crap together. The other option is you can come in there with an attitude of extreme ownership. And you can say, look, um, we're falling behind. This is my fault. Uh, this is you, you can attribute this to a number of different areas. You can say, I didn't train you well enough. I haven't been present enough in fundraising. I haven't been working you know, close enough and running drills with you guys on scripts and conversations. Somehow, I have not been present here. And you should, put a, you should have put a lot of time into thinking about the specific ways where you can do things better. Because as the team leader, as the candidate, you're ultimately responsible for your team's performance. And so if they're not doing things right, at some level, you're failing as a leader. And that has to be a core belief that you have. So you come in and you lay out these different ways that you're failing. And you say, I want to apologize for these failures. 
and I'll let you know they're not going to happen again. So here's what we're going to do to remedy those. I'm going to be present in these fundraisers. I'm going to write different scripts. I'm going to you know, drill with you guys each individually. We're going to spend some time together each week. You come together, whatever they may be, or maybe it's, you're going to go out in the field with them knocking more doors with your team because you don't think they're pushing hard enough, and you're going to go out there and you're, not, you're going to be the hardest worker on the ground, and so you're going to show them the tempo you want them to take. The difference coming out of those two meetings that we described here is incredible. In case one, where you're making excuses and talking about how great of a leader you are, uh, everybody else is going to nod their head and assent. They know their problems. They know they haven't been pulling their, you know, doing, executing things well, even if they don't know how to do them differently. And they're going to come out of there not having disagree with you in most cases, but they're going to come out with a much lower opinion of your leadership abilities. Because they don't need to be told that it's their fault. They don't need to be told that they're underperforming. They know that already. What they need is they need somebody to show them that there's a way to do some things differently and there's a way to win. By virtue of the fact they're on your team that they've stepped up to either take a low-paying, you know, paid job or to be a volunteer, these people are dedicated. These people want to fight for you and with you. And so for you to just take your time to beat down on them and talk about how crappy they are through talking, you know, by pointing out how great of a leader you are. And so therefore they're the problem. You're just going to crush their souls. And so you're just going to make it harder and harder, which is what Bo Cruz six's leader did. The alternative is you can be somebody who's going to take responsibility and is going to motivate your team and is going to show them a path forward where they see none. Because if they saw a path forward that led to them executing those goals and everything, they would do that. And so you have to take ownership. You have to own the problems and the solutions and both of those together will make it to where you can provide strong leadership to your team and you can actually turn it around. As you're preparing to run for office, to be a good consultant, to be a volunteer coordinator, to be a field staff, or whatever this, the leadership role that you're next preparing for, and some of you may not even know what that is, whatever it is, you need to embrace these principles of leadership. The idea of taking ownership and knowing, believing in every bone in your body that there are no bad teams, there's only bad leaders. That means if your team is not performing well, it's your fault. And there's honestly a lot of great power in that. In the in the first chapter in the book, Jocko talks about a situation where he took ownership of a situation that was absolutely horrendous. They had a um, they had a kind of basically what we call a blue on green situation where uh, one of the, one of their units was going into assault a building. There was a communication error, and as a result, they assaulted a building where they were they had their own guys inside. An Iraqi uh, off an Iraqi soldier was killed. A friendly Iraqi soldier was killed by their team in a in a blue on green, basically fracture side. And as he was trying to figure out how to deal with the situation, he knew that the his chain of command was coming in. This is a very bad thing. Obviously, somebody you know a friendly had lost their life. And there were a lot of different ways that, uh, that Jocko could have handled it. But two, primarily, he could have blamed the guy that pulled the trigger, could have blamed the guy that didn't check the radio codes, he could have blamed the guy who picked the door to go through. He could have blamed a whole lot of guys on his team. Or he could have taken responsibility. And in taking responsibility, he had a, he was playing a very, very, uh, a game, not really a game, but he was, he was making a bet. Um, one, knew it was the right thing to do that it was ultimately his fault as the leader of the team. But he also knew that if he blamed others and if his leadership saw him just passing the buck, that was going to be, he was going to be showing an incredibly poor leadership ability that they would respond very heavily against. That that would actually, they would see that as a longer term, bigger problem than the blue on green. So what he did was he went in and he, in front of his whole team, his whole task force, sat down and said, Who, whose fault is this? And the guy, to his credit, who pulled the trigger, stood up and said, sir, it was mine. I, I went through the door. I pulled the trigger. It's my fault. And the guy who had not deconflicted the radio codes, which led, which was one of the factors that led to the, the problems, said, sir, it was mine. I, I didn't get it. And each, each one of these guys that stood up, and there were a bunch of them that took, them, took responsibility, said, no, you're, it's not your fault. At the end, he said, it's my fault. And he laid out the reasons or the things that he had done or not done that, that he believed he contributed. And he said, this is what we're doing moving forward to make sure this doesn't happen again because we cannot let this happen again. The price is too high to fail in this kind of way. And through that, not only did he 
show some incredible leadership abilities and did he inspire his team and did his team his team wanted to pick up and do things differently and not make those same failures because they didn't want to put him in that situation again but he also saved his job by showing that strong leadership ability to his to his upline to his superiors i think there's a lot of times in business or other areas where ultimately we see ourselves as expendable and we're afraid that if we accept responsibility for a failure if we don't deflect and try to put somebody else in the crosshairs, that the people who are managing us or who are responsible for whether we have our job or not, they're going to see our accepting responsibility as a sign of great weakness. And so that, that since in some level we see ourselves expendable, we're going to say, okay, well, if I accept responsibility here, I'm done. And so we're scared of that. We're scared to take ownership because we don't know what's going to happen. And we're afraid we're gonna, that it's going to be game over if we say, yep, I'm the reason we have this failure. It may seem counterintuitive to a lot of people, but ultimately, I think that that's uh, one that's not true. You may have some leaders who say, you know what, yep, because the, they're looking for a scapegoat themselves. And so if you run into a leader that's looking for a scapegoat, that's a bad leader, then yeah, they might can your ass. But for the vast majority of situations, if you're working for somebody who's a leader, they're going to recognize what you're doing. They're going to respect that. And as long as you execute a good plan to remedy those things and you come together owning the, not just the problem but the solutions as well, they're going to respect that because they're going to see somebody that's willing to fight through, take ownership, and fix the situation. And if you're owning the problem, then the fact that you own the solutions means a whole lot more. If you come in there and say, well, this really isn't my fault, and here, you know, Johnny and Fred, they really screwed up here and caused us to fail this product launch, but here, I'm going to fix this. If you're unwilling to own the problems, then they believe that you're going to own the solutions. It's hard to find. It's hard for me to believe that. So what I want you guys to do is I highly recommend you pick up the book Extreme Ownership. It's on audio, audio book through Audible. Um, they got, Jocko's got a great podcast. We just a leadership focused podcast, a lot of interviews, as well as uh, kind of goes through some books in a much better way than I did today. Um, I really want to see more candidates who are good leaders because uh, it's really hard to find them, honestly. And when I do, it really excites me. If, you wanna, if you're a conservative especially, if you're the kind of person that I would love to snap my fingers and put you into office because of the way you're in a vote and the, the way you're going to conduct yourself, I also want you to be a good leader. And so many people don't see that as something that they need to work on, that is a skill that's perishable. They either believe they're a good leader or they don't. And far too many people believe themselves to be good leaders when they're not, and more, more importantly and more devastatingly, they don't work on it. And so if, uh, if you're not working to become a better leader, then you're not one. So pick up Extreme Ownership. Read that through. I'd love to get any feedback you guys have on it, whether it's pro or con. Um, I'm sure some of you guys may not like what they have to say, may not agree with all of it. Um, email me, raz at mycampaigncoach.com, and uh, I'll send you a study guide that I actually put together that I use in our coaching with candidates, a bunch of questions and some synopses that I put together in the book uh, as I've read it a couple times to help kind of guide the study, make sure it's, it's candidate specific. So a lot of the questions that I ask are very purpose driven towards campaigns. Uh, you can Google and there's some other study guides out there, some cliff notes of some of the lessons from a more business side. But given the subject matter, I wanted to kind of customize the way I was looking at it to make sure that we weren't losing track of the application to a campaign or public service. If you want to help us out in other ways, we love rating us on iTunes. Uh, any help you can give us there would be great. Sharing this, sharing the podcast, uh, give me feedback. You know, when you email me to ask for the study guide, you know, give me some feedback, pro or con. You know, how are you liking some of the monologues? Do you want to show I'd stop and just do interviews? Do you want more of something or less of others? I, I really want to get y'all's feedback. I want to be constantly trying to make this better. Ultimately, it's uh, not of a whole lot of use if I'm just talking to the mic or interviewing people that you guys don't want to hear from. So if you got any recommendations on individuals or the types of people that you'd like to, to hear from, let me know. We've got some good interviews that I'm doing later this week that I think you guys will enjoy and we'll be getting up in the weeks to come and working, uh, working on a number of others that I think you guys will get a lot out of. Hope you guys have a fantastic week and that uh, your, all your planning and execution for your campaigns is going well. Give us a shout if we can do anything to help. Please subscribe and rate us on iTunes to help spread the word. We'll be back with you next week with more campaign insights from My Campaign Coach.